So, sometimes I think we can find ourselves in a place where we miss the obvious. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to be talking about generosity through this month. Now, I want to tell you why we're talking about generosity. Because we are in the month of what? Of, of Thanksgiving. The month of Thanksgiving. And I want you to know that we only are able to connect with being thankful when we understand the generosity that we receive that creates a thankfulness in our heart. And so the more we understand the generosity that has been given to us, the more thankful we can be. Now, my intent, and I told the first group this, my intent is for this message is not going to be a long message. But then when I said that, my mom cringed in the front seat. And then I remember those times when my dad would get up and he'd say, uh, this, this is going to be a short message this morning. And then we get in the car and my mom would look at him and go, I thought you said it was going to be a short message. <laughs> so I realize when a preacher says that, you get a little nervous. You can get a little nervous when he says it's going to be But I really believe it will be a, a shorter message this morning, but a powerful message. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 8, look with me if you would. And we're going to begin reading. I'm going to begin reading in verse 7. Now, I would hope you have your Bible with you, uh, whether that be a, a physical uh, paper edition or whether it's on your, uh, on your phone or iPad or whatever it might be. Uh, please, I want to encourage you, always pull it out. I want you to feel it, touch it. It is the sword of the Spirit, and every warrior ought to have that sword in their hand. They really should. Okay. But for those of you that may not have it with you today, we do have it here on the screen as well. It says, beginning in verse number 7, But as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Now, I want to stop there for just a moment, and I want to help you understand that what What's being said here, Paul is saying you're abounding, you're exceeding in abundance in these different areas. You're learning how to do certain things and, and to be equipped certain ways. But in all you're doing, don't fail in the act of grace. Kind of like, let's go back to the basics for a moment. Let's not let the obvious be overlooked here. And he says, this act of grace, and it goes on to say then, um, in verse number 8, it says, I say this, I say this not as a command, but to prove, what does it say? To prove by the earnestness of others that you are what? Love is also what? So we're talking this morning about how that God wants us to have a genuine love. How do we have a genuine love? What does that look like? How do we put a, a face on what genuine love looks like? Well, I trust that before you leave this place this morning, you'll have a better understanding. We'll unpack this in such a way that you'll have a better understanding of what a, a sincere love really looks like. But it goes on to say, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Now, I just want to take a few moments, and I want to unpack this passage for you. See, one of the things I want you to see here is that the Apostle Paul is saying that you abound in faith, all right? And we abound in faith. We come to church, and the reason we come to church is in order that we can grow in our faith. Because the Bible says... Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so we grow in our faith by being here at church every Sunday. I, I believe that's really important for us to, to be in church. Not only on Sunday, but if you have the opportunity to be here on Tuesday night for Bible study, Wednesday morning for Bible study, whenever there's an opportunity to be under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a valuable piece to you in your growth of faith. Now... Also, Colby and Marianne have a Hope's Point that happens on Saturday night, 6 o'clock, right? 6 o'clock. 
And uh, again, they have uh, their service and, and Bible study, and, and they open the Word of God. And listen, it's times for us to grow in our faith. That's really important. We need to do that. Not only do we grow in our faith, the Apostle Paul says, but also he goes on to talk about, uh, he says here uh, in verse 7, in faith, in speech, that means in the ability to, to uh, express ourselves. You know, when people first get saved, they, they get a little shy and intimidated to share with others Jesus because they say, you know, I really don't know what to say. I'm just not sure. I don't know. You know, I'm afraid that somebody might ask me something I can't answer. But the more we grow in our faith, the more as well we're able to grow in our speech, our ability to share with others. Now... Does that mean we ought to wait until we know how to do it? Listen, the Bible tells those, we see the stories many times where Jesus touched somebody and he said, go back home and share with them what I've done for you. You say, well, pastor, I wouldn't know what to say to somebody. Just tell them what Jesus did for you. That's all you got to do. It's your personal testimony. We sang a song about story, you know, earlier. And everybody's story is important. You know, everybody's got a story and every story matters. Did you know that? Your story matters. Your life matters. Your life makes an impact in the lives of other people. And that's really important to know and to understand. But how will they know that story unless you open your mouth and you share it? But we excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, our ability to, to gather our thoughts, to put things together out of the Word of God. In all earnestness. That means being very diligent and faithful. Being sincere at what we do. Putting our hands to something and, and, and being faithful to that. But then it says, also, we excel in our love for you. Wow, you know, we even have those who care for us. And their care and their love excels in our life. It grows in our life. And in all these things that we excel in, the scripture goes on to say there, as Paul said... See that you don't miss this. Don't miss this. Excel in this act of grace. So what is the act of grace? The act of grace is showing a genuine and sincere love. Well, pastor, what does a sincere, genuine, sincere love look like? Well, I love how the Apostle Paul gives us the example of Jesus here. He says Jesus who was rich. What, what does it mean that Jesus was rich? Can somebody tell me? What does it mean that he was rich? What's that? Okay, in love. He's rich in love. What else? How else is he rich? I don't think you're going to have a wrong answer in any of this. So some of you might be a little nervous. I don't want to answer because you might say wrong. All right, I don't think you're going to get this question wrong. What is he rich in? Everything. He encompasses the universe. He created all things that exist. He is life itself. So he who was rich, he who had everything, he was in heaven with his father, and he walked away from the riches of heaven. And all that he had, he became flesh. And he took on human flesh to dwell among us. In order that he could be touched with our infirmities. I don't know if you understand what that means. And probably none of us really could ever completely get our head wrapped around that because there's probably none of us in here that are going to be so and, and I used I, I don't even like to use the word filthy but it, it would apply being filthy rich and walking away from all those riches in order to become like a common person Jesus left everything he who was rich became poor for you and for me. Now that's a genuine love. That is an act of grace, is it not? He who is rich, who had everything, the comforts of heaven, a beautiful place in the arms of his Father, 
the essence of, of, of all that we could ever dream or imagine to be beautiful. Matter of fact, heaven, the, the scripture tells us that even our greatest, wildest imagination of what heaven would be like will be the most minute thing that will be in heaven. We can't even fathom what heaven's going to be like. Matter of fact, when God gave the uh, instruction for the letter to be written to explain heaven, the author said, I can't even put in human words certain things. I'm incapable of expressing to you what it looks like and, and what's here. It's amazing. And Jesus left that place for you and for me he became poor he left the riches of heaven and became poor why did he do that look on in that verse it says yet for your sakes he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich now, what does that mean, that we might become rich? If I were to ask you here this morning, if, if you believe you're rich, probably most of you in this room would probably not raise your hand because you would think monetarily, I am not rich. I don't have a huge abundance. It's not like I've, you know, I'm not that filthy rich guy you're talking about, Pastor. I don't, I'm not rich. But what is this talking about? Jesus left heaven for you, became poor on our behalf in order that we could encounter his love, in order that we could become rich in him, in the spirit of truth and love and peace and joy. We can have something we could never have apart from him. See, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's our power. It's the essence of our reason for life and living. He became poor for us in order that we could become rich. And not only rich in the greatness of, of spiritual things on this earth, but my friend, I want you to understand, we are one day going to be in heaven, seated in heavenly places. And I want you to understand, one day we're going to be in that place to live with God. And He's gone to prepare a place for us. And if He's gone to prepare a place for us, He will no doubt come again and receive us unto Himself. That where He is, we get to hang out too. Is that amazing or what? He became poor in order that we could have all these wonderful, amazing blessings. Hey, in this series of generosity, I want you to know this. That the foundation of our generosity is understanding what Jesus Christ has done for us. And not only Jesus, but the Father God. The Bible says, for God so loved you and I that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but they'll have ever lasting life he who had nothing can have everything through Christ the hope and the joy that we have is not found in ourselves; it's found in Jesus Christ and him alone see Jesus died on the cross for you and for me he came down from heaven left his home there the riches of heaven, the wonderful place of heaven, and he came to this earth and he was touched with our infirmities and our, he was afflicted, he was, he was whipped and, and denied, he was rejected on your behalf and on mine. Amen. Jesus, who was sinless, took on your sin. And when he took on your sin, they nailed him to the cross. And he paid the price for your sin on that cross. What do you mean, pastor, he paid the price? Well, just simply understand this, that the wages of sin or the payment of sin is death. And every one of us that are born are born into sin. Did you know that? You don't become a sinner when you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. 
You, you, you are no more a sinner when you sin as a dog is a dog when he barks. He barks because he's a dog. And we sin because we're sinners. And we're born sinners. And so we're born already condemned. Our sin condemns us before God. And yet God the Father loved us so much, He gave His only begotten Son to come to this earth to pay a price that we could not pay for our own sin. And he who knew no sin became sin for us. And he paid that gruesome price on the cross of Calvary for sin because the Bible says the wages of sin, the payment of sin is death. It's more than just a physical death. It is a spiritual death. Do you know what a spiritual death is? Spiritual death is separation from God for the rest of eternity. Do you know that? There was one part of the story that has bugged me to no end when I would hear about how that Jesus, when he hung on the cross, there he hung between heaven and earth, and, and people were reviling him and, and spitting on him and mocking him and making fun of him. And in the whole process of that, there's one part that always bugged me. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I thought, yeah, that's right. I mean, when everybody else, why... The Father, why did he forsake Jesus? Let me tell you why. Because the ultimate price of sin is separation from the Father. And had he not encountered that separation from the Father, he would have not paid the full price of our sin on the cross. But he did. And there he paid that full price on Calvary. He gave up his life on that cross. No man took it from him. He simply said, it is finished. I love those words. Hey, I love those words. Especially when you're on a winning team and things are going well and the buzzer goes, and the game's over and you win. Isn't that a great feeling? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> it is for me. Or how about when you go and you take a test? And when you get done, the teacher hands your paper to you and you made 100% on the test. Yes, that feels good, right? Or you fill out an application and you're hoping for a job and all of a sudden you get this phone call that says, hey, we need you to come in for an interview because uh, we like everything you gave us on your, on your application. And you go and it's like, yes, this is awesome. Jesus said, it is finished the finished work of jesus christ happened on that cross they took him down from that cross they put him in a tomb and three days later what happened on that third day he arose from the dead triumphant over sin and death over the power of sin isn't it amazing that Jesus Christ paid this price for us that we could not pay ourselves? God gave us a lot of time between the taking of the fruit in the garden until Jesus died on the cross to try to do everything to show God that we could do it without Him. And so we had these Ten Commandments and all we had to do was just keep them all. And if you didn't keep all of them, you broke all of them. Even if you did one wrong, you broke them all. God gave us plenty of time to prove to ourselves we couldn't do it. So then he gave his son Jesus to do what we could not do. And through Jesus, all the law and the prophets were fulfilled in him. Complete. And now... Three days later, he arose again from the dead, and he has ascended into heaven. But before he went into heaven, he said to us, he said, look, I want you to go, and I want you to make disciples. What was he doing? He was going back to the basics. What was the very first thing Jesus did when he started his earthly ministry? He went out and he called his disciples, didn't he? And he started training them. Do you know that's the thing that God wants us to do? After we become a believer, we're to be a disciple of Jesus and we're to grow in our faith and then we're to put our arm around other people and we're to help them to grow in their faith as well. That's our responsibility. So if we want to understand this act of grace, all we need to do is look at the story of Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross of Calvary. But let's look ahead here at verse number 12. 
in verse 13. In verse 12 it says, For if the readiness is there, in other words, we have to set our mind on these things first. That's where it starts, setting your mind. It starts with a, a thought. All right, I've given this little formula. I'll give it to you. You want to you wanna change your destiny in life? Do you not like the destiny you have in life right now? Let me tell you how you change it. You say, Pastor, please do. I've been trying to figure this out forever. Let me tell you, here it is. It's real simple. But it's simple to understand. It's a process, though, but it's simple to understand. Here's how it works. It starts with a thought. You have to think the right things. You have to choose certain things that need to change in your life. It starts in a thought. Then it goes from a thought to an action. And that action has to be so faithful and consistent, it turns into a habit in your life. And that habit then becomes a part of your character. And your character will, will determine your destiny. So if you don't like where you're headed in life, you have to change your mind about some things. Then you have to turn it to action because application makes all the difference. You turn it to action and that action becomes a habit after a period of time. And then all of a sudden people start looking at you at a certain way and your character is developed around other people. And they begin to see who you really are and that will determine your destiny and where you're going to go in life. A thought. Turns to action, action to habit, happen, habit turns to character, and character determines your destiny. So what do we find? That in this process, look at it, it says here in verse number 12. For if the readiness is there, if, if you'll set your mind on it, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to to what he does not have. Simply what is being said here, the Apostle Paul says we ought to be a generous people that are giving just like Jesus Christ was giving. We ought to give. And what do we have to give? Well, he's already mentioned what we have. We have to give here, he said in verse number 7, faith, speech, knowledge, uh, an earnestness. As we have been loved, we ought to as well love with a sincere, a genuine love. These are the things we have to offer. And he's saying, I'm not asking you to give something you don't have. Have you ever felt like you were being asked for something from somebody that you didn't have the ability to do? On occasion, my wife does that to me. She'll ask me to do something around the house. I'm like, uh, okay, YouTube. All right. And I got to figure it out really quick because I really don't know what I'm doing. But I got her fooled to think I do. How many of you use YouTube to figure things out? Hey, you could, build, you could rebuild a car watching YouTube. I'm just saying. All right, anyway, never done it, but here's, here's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He's saying, I'm not saying that you are to give something you don't have. You're to give what you do have. You might, have, uh, uh, you might have an ability to, to show generosity to someone in hospitality. You might be a person that's a people person. And boy, you just make friends with people. And you get around people. Now listen to me for a minute. Don't miss what I'm saying. That may be you or it may not be you. That may be somebody else. And you look and you go, oh, you know, if I was like them, yeah, you know, God could use me too. You know what? Let's quit making up excuses to why we're not being used to God because we're not like somebody else. What I want you to understand is that every one of us have something to contribute and to give. You might not be that people person that can just like sit down with anybody and everybody's a, a, an unmet friend. That's what my mom and dad always said about me. Everybody in life is just an unmet friend for you. That's true. We moved to California and uh, moved to Paducah. I said, Mom, Dad, I'll be back. First day we got there, they're, un they're pulling everything out of the U-Haul. I'm like, I'll be back. I'm going to go make friends. I'd go and knock on somebody's door and say, hey, do you have any kids about my age? <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, hold on a minute. They'd come to the door. I'd say, hi, my name's John. What's yours? They'd tell me. I'd say, will you be my friend? Everybody's an unmet friend for me. I did that in California. I saw a kid riding down the road. And I chased him down. I'm like, hey, hey, stop. <laughs> What's your name? And he told me, I said, my name's John. Will you be my friend? We're just moved into town. He became, he became my best friend in California. 
the first person I met. I, that's me. That's my personality. Now, put me in a crowd. I don't, you know, I know I preach and I get up. I don't like to be in front of a crowd. I don't like to be in front of people like this. This just, like, is not, this is hard for me. My wife will tell you I'm a nervous wreck before I preach every Sunday and stuff. This is not, this is not natural for me. But I can tell you this. That what God gives us the ability to do, we ought to embrace those moments and we ought to use that as God has given us the ability. Not that we make excuses that we don't do what we should do because we're not like somebody else. You are able to bring to the table something that somebody else cannot. And you need to. He says, I'm not asking you to give something you don't have the ability to do. It goes on to say in verse 13, For I did not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need that their may be fairness. You know what he's simply saying? That when we come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, we become a part of a body. And not all of us are an eye, and not all of us are an ear, and not all of us are a mouth. But as a body collectively, we're able to accomplish what God wants done. And you've got to figure out what part you are. And you've got to allow God to use you on that level. Some people are more a mouth, and some people are more the ears, and there are others that are more the hands and they just love to be in the background and do work and not be noticed. And then there's others that are feet and they have the capability of getting something move, moving along and getting things to happen. Every one of us has something to bring. Now, I don't want you to miss this this morning. As believers in Jesus Christ, all of us are to be the church. When we go out of this building, we are to be the church. But can I help you understand something? You individually by yourself are not the church. The church is a collection of fellow believers that are a, a unit, a piece. And, and you know what? Somebody say, oh, we have church in our, in our house. We do Bible studies there and we're, we have a church. No, you don't. You don't have a church. You say, you can't say that, Pastor. It's, it's God's people. That's a church. Look, a church, according to the definition of Scripture, is those <coughs> who exercise the ordinances of Scripture as well. A church is an organized body of believers who accomplish the ordinances of the church, taking of the Lord's Supper, as well as the Lord's baptism, and, and then as well, uh, there is a structure that God puts together of elders that serve and minister within that local body of believers, and that is what's known as a church. It's not a building, it's a people, but it's a collection of people. Now, why do I say that? I say that for this reason. We need to pull back away from these verses for a moment and look and see what are we, what are we reading. We're reading out of the book of what? Book of what? Book of Corinthians. Why are we reading out of a book of Corinthians? Where did that come from? We know who the author was, right? It was Paul, but why did he write it? Because he was writing it to the church of Corinth. He wasn't just writing it to the city of Corinth. He is writing it to the church of Corinth. It is a, a, a local body of believers at Corinth. And so understanding that, you have to take what God is saying here in the perimeters of what he's talking about. He's saying that within the body of believers, the church, we ought to be caring for one another's needs. Where you have the ability to do something, you ought to help other people. Where somebody else has an ability, they ought to be helping you. Maybe you're a plumber and you have the ability to plumb. <laughs> All right? Preachers preach and plumbers plumb, right? If you have the ability to, to do plumbing work and somebody has a need in the church, you ought to be willing to step up and say, hey, I'll help you. I can help you with that. And on the same hand, that person has an ability that they ought to be able to shower that off onto other people or even the person who helped them with their plumbing. And we all have the ability to help one another. We do. If we'll just do it. Look, I just don't want to be a church that we come and we sit in pews and do what my father used to call be pew flowers. 
We're not here to decorate a pew. And the other side of that pew flower is a pew flower. We don't want to be a pew flower, right? We want, to be a, we want to be a living organism that's making a difference in the world and making a difference in the lives of one another. And when we see the need that somebody else has, that we're willing to reach out and to help them. And what does it say there in that passage? Not that he's saying that you ought to be, uh, that, that it says not that others should be at ease and you burdened but that as a matter of fairness, that we give out of our abundance. So as I was sharing with the other group, I've shared this with probably three or four different people over the course of the last, oh, five years, I guess. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, you know, I don't know how I'm going to make, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I got X amount of dollars that comes in, and my bills, I, I just, I can't seem to get them paid. And I said, fine, let's sit down and figure this out. What's going on? And so we'll kind of write things out. Next thing you know, what I've come to find out is they're typically, they have the gift of generosity and they love, they, they have the, the, their love language is the, the language of gifts and they like to give to other people and do for other people. And, and so they have a big heart. They're very generous. And I say, hey, let me ask you a question kind of getting their attention for a minute. I say, what is your strength in your life? My strength? Yeah, what's your strength? Oh, I guess, you know, I, I care about other people. I, I'm generous. I want to be nice to others. I want to help others. I said, that's awesome. That's amazing. Now let me ask you another question. What is your weakness? And I've had people look at me and go, uh. And they might name off a few things. And I look at them and I say, no, you've already told me what your weakness is. They say, I did? Yeah. Oh, what is it, Pastor? I say your weakness is your strength out of control. When your strength is out of control, it becomes your weakness. So you're too generous. You're giving away money you don't have. I said, you know, and I know you're going to shame me probably as your pastor, but I did say it, and I have said it several times. I said, why don't you just get your gun, go down here at the bank, and why don't you take their money too, and why don't you give it away? Because that's what you're doing when you take veterans money and Evansville Water Department money and you're giving away that money and now you can't pay your bills. You're giving away something that's not yours. Paul's saying, I'm not asking you to put yourself in a hurt. What he's saying is he's simply saying, in your abundance. So my counsel had been to them, here's what I tell them. Look, after you pay your tithe, after you pay your vectoring, your water bill, your regular bills, you, you do the things that you know are your responsibilities and you know they're important pieces, you take care of those first and then whatever's left, you can do with it whatever you want. And by the way, I'd make a suggestion, you might want to buy some food, it might be a necessity. <laughs> okay? But after you buy yourself some food, put it in a refrigerator or whatever, Whatever's left, you can do with it whatever you want to do with it. You can share it with other people. You can help somebody else. Listen, Paul is simply saying here, I'm not asking you to give something you do not have. I'm asking you to give according to the abundance that God blesses you with. And every one of us have the ability to do that, to love like Jesus. Hey, we can say we love Jesus. But until we have that act of grace that expresses that love to others, it's not genuine in the eyes of others at all. We've got to be genuine in our love. Jesus is our prime example of what that looks like. Every head bowed and every eye closed.